of you guys play chess? I don't play chess. I see one or two hands, a couple of hands. Okay. I don't play chess. <clears throat> probably a good thing because I probably wouldn't do well. But chess, a lot of people love it. Well, here's what's interesting. There was one day uh, <clears throat> a master chess player went into a, an art museum. And as he's walking through looking at things, he saw a picture of a chess match. A painting. And so he was watching it. He was kind of taking it in, engrossed with it. And as he looked further, he noticed as the match was taking place who the two opponents were. One opponent was a young man. Another opponent was Satan. So they're having this, this chess match and they're playing. And then you look deeper at the young man and you see the sweat. You see the tints on his face and what's going on. And the curator comes up and they're talking and he keeps looking. And then underneath, the, there's a title to the work. Checkmate. Checkmate, which chess lingo means game over. I got you. You're done. But the, 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 the master sat there and he looked and he kept studying the painting. And then a little smile came across his face. And he looked at the curator and he said, young man's got another move. He's got another move. Game's not over. You know, in life, you and I will look at our circumstances and be it due to Satan, someone else, something else. All we hear is checkmate in a certain situation, a certain event, a certain station. And the good news of the gospel is God looks at your life and my life and says, you've got another move. You have another opportunity. And that's what we see today in God's word. We're in second. Kings verse 20, or chapter 20, <clears throat> as we're going through the life of Hezekiah, we see the God of another chance. God is the God of another chance. He's not a, a God just of yesterday, not just of tomorrow. He's a God of today who will walk us through. Now, the, what's going on here in, in, in Hezekiah's life, he's a king of Judah. He's been fighting, dealing with Assyria, dealing with other issues, but he's at a very difficult point. He is not well. And it looks like it's an end-of-life situation. We're introduced to the prophet Isaiah. We know him well. If He's in the Old Testament book of Isaiah that God gave to him, 66 chapters. And in chapters 36 through 39, much of what we're reading here in 2 Kings today is the same story that is in the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah was a contemporary of Hezekiah. He spoke into Hezekiah's life on behalf of God. And so you have Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah working through a very serious issue and what God proved to Hezekiah is that he would give him another chance. You're going to have another chance because of how everything transpired. So we're just going to walk through this, this together. We're in 2 Kings chapter 20 verses 1 through 11. Uh, all the verses I read will be on the, the screen before me or behind me rather, but feel free to grab a Bible. If you have your Bible, please do that. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in the chair line. And at home, I hope you're able to, to get your, your Bible as well. So let's, let's go. Let's see what God has to say. And we begin very simply with 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came in and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Set your house in order, for you are going to die and not live. You know, sometimes when you and I look at life, it seems time like all of our chances are used up, does it not? All of our chances in a particular situation, in a relationship, in, in, a, in a friendship, in, in a marriage, in a financial situation, in a work situation. If we're not careful with our health, in some regard, it seems like it's, it's used up. And we see that with Hezekiah. It was his time to die. Life was over. Mortally ill, sick to the point of death. When God walks in, when God's prophet walks in and says, yeah, put your life in order. Okay. He doesn't mean get things organized because we're about to do some new stuff. He's saying, take care of your finances. Make sure your wills are good. Make sure your life estate's in place. Make sure everything's good because the time has come. So that, that's how serious this context is and what's going on here. And so he's saying physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, every way that you can think of, you're done. Chances seemed up. Now let's go from a very intense situation to something a bunch of us do every now and then. That's play games on our phone or on our device. And some of you play word crossy. Now, 
I had to ask Amy for the name of this, but she plays it, and I've played it with her a little bit in Matthew. But basically, and you may have Candy Crush or whatever, but what's the purpose of the game? The purpose of the game is always to win. purpose of this game, you see all the, the letters in the bottom circle in the middle. You're to make new words. Okay. So it's one of those crossword puzzle, challenge your mind things. They can be a lot of fun. They can be very addicting for some people. But as you're playing the game, if you get messed up, it'll give you hints. If you really get messed up, you can, you can quote, buy hints with giving up points or whatever. But if you just can't figure it out, you lose the game or got to scroll to another. Your chances are up. Sometimes you and I feel like our chances are up. But see, in that game, just like it will give us hints, just like it will come alongside and say, hey, I'll help you out a little bit. God is always sitting there saying, your chance ain't up yet. I'm working in your life. I'm ministering. There is an opportunity. And so what we see here is Hezekiah is struggling. And what's going on was his chance up. But let me, before we see that it wasn't, let's go a little deeper and just ask you to, to process this today. Where are you thinking something, something's done? Is it your health? Is it in your finances? Is it in a relationship? Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's a relationship with your children. Maybe it's a relationship with grandchildren. Maybe it's a long-term relationship with a friend. Maybe it's something at work that's just not seeing right and you're seeming right and you're like, well, I, th I think that's done. Or once again, with, within your health. Here's what I want to challenge you to today as we walk through this passage is to honestly evaluate the different circumstances of life and say, God, where do I feel like there's checkmate? Where, where does it just seem like that opportunity is done? Now, sometimes they are for God's purposes. But a lot, a lot of times we seem like they are when God is just saying, what you ha can do is done. Let's try what I can do next. And that's what we're, where we are today with Hezekiah. So we see that in verse 1. Sometimes it appears our chances are over, that, that, that some situation is not going to happen anymore. But let's look at verses 2 and 3 and see how we step into this. Okay? Look at verse 2 and 3. Then he, he would be Hezekiah, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, Please, Lord, just remember how, high, how I have walked before you wholeheartedly and in truth and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept profusely. What an amazing encounter with God by Hezekiah. And we see here, it's okay to seek another chance from God. It's okay to turn our head toward the wall and saying, God, please. And that's exactly what he says. You know, I hear from even maybe myself sometimes, but I hear from people say, well, I can't ask God that. I can't plead that with God. It is what it is. No, it's not is what it is. It may eventually be because God is sovereign may say, no, you, I'm not going to answer that. But God is always there to be sought. And we see that here. And, and notice, as that man of faith, he sought another, uh, another chance. And look at the intensity. You know, he turned his face and, and, and he, he prayed. You know, so he turned his face. Hey, it was just him and God now. You had a moment like that. You go into a room, you just shut the door. You turn off every device. You don't want to talk to anybody but God. And that's what his situation was. It was him and God. He was in agony. He was in pain. He, he prayed, and I, I love this statement, divine sovereignty, divine sovereignty, excuse me, does not render prayer and sickness inappropriate. As we pray, God will answer with a plan, and sometimes he does. Sometimes we'll be told, no, don't pray about that, just take, no, it's okay to come before the Father. Notice, he, he begged him, God, remember what I've done. Now, we have to be careful. There's a fine line between bargaining and trusting, but he laid it all out there. God, please. And then notice that end that shows the intensity. He wept profusely. He just let it flow. He just let it go. It's intense. Sometimes when life is tough, we feel like we just have to take it. Okay, I just got to take it. I messed up. And sometimes, let's be honest with you, some of our tough times are because we messed up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Some of our tough times are because of the consequences of what we've done. Okay, that, that, that always needs to be understood. But we serve a gracious God. And if we're not careful, what happens, we'll say, you know what, that's my fault. I have to take it. You know what, that's just fate. As a follower of Christ, there's nothing in Scripture that says there's fate. I don't believe in fate. Now, if you do, that's fine. That's, your bit. that's, that's fine. I don't believe in fate. I don't believe that, that I'm fated to certain things. God is sovereign. God will work. But I don't have to have a tough time and say, I just got to suck it up and, and take it because God had fated to that. What? No. I can go before the Father. Now, he may come back and say, Albert, no, it, 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 I'm not going to answer that prayer. But I always have that opportunity. And that's what we see here to go before the Father and seek his grace, seek his mercy, understand his sovereignty, let him work and move. Hezekiah counted on that. He counted on God hearing him. Why can't I? Why can't you? When we have a relationship with Christ, we have the ability, like any person of Scripture, to hear God work and see God work. And so... Will you, will you stop saying there's nothing I can do? And will you start seeking God's face and say, God, I, I feel like it's over. God, I don't see how I'm going to get through this. God, I, I, feel like, I feel like you've told me it's done. But God, will you work? That's a challenge. Okay. So we see that, that, that it seems to be over. He pleads. Now, how does God respond? Look at verses 4 through 7. Before I get there, though, I got a verse to read. So, notice this from the psalmist. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my pleas. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, and the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save my life. Now, what a great prayer from the psalmist there, the intensity. What's interesting about this verse is if you were to go down in this chapter in 116 and you, you get over to the verse 15. Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. See, I can be intense with God. I can, let, I can share with him my heart, but I know that he's got me. And one day, he will smile as I come into his presence. And what a cool dichotomy in this chapter from the psalmist. All right. Now let's go to verses 4 through 7. And even before Isaiah had left the middle courtyard, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Let me go back. I lost my place. You know, sometimes, do you ever lose your place? <laughs> I do too much. Let's go back to, I, I, I realized that, I, Esther, you're awesome because she's having to hang with me today because I've been all over the map and people don't know that. Okay. Verse 4, and even before Isaiah had left the middle courtyard, the word of the Lord came to him saying, return. And say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord said. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I am going to heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. And I will add 15 yard, years, 15 yards would work, but 15 years to your life. And I will, say you, I will say, save you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will protect this city for my own sake and for my servant's sake. Then Isaiah said, take a cake of figs. And they took it and placed it on the inflamed spot. And he recovered. A good God offers another chance. Hear this. A good God offers another chance. That's what's going on here. God is offering that chance. God is giving that. And notice what he did. And this, folks, this is the root of the gospel. That God is good. And through Christ, he always offers another chance, another opportunity. And we see that here. Notice how God, 
God acted like that. He, he jumped in immediately. You know, he heard the prayer. He listened. He saw the tears. He, he, he brought healing. He delivered him. He said, I will protect you. God responded after he was sought. It would be very interesting, you know, every now and then you, you, you look at movies or something and they'll have different endings and, and things like that. And be very interesting to say, what had happened if he had not done this or not done that? You know, if he had never turned his face toward the wall and asked, we wouldn't be reading this today. But here's the reality. He did. And he said, God, I don't feel like I'm done yet. Please. There's a, a figure of speech called don't leave money on the table. Now, it applies. It's a euphemism, an idiom that we use. But a lot of what it applies to, let's say you're going to get a job. So, Mackenzie, you're walking up to your employer. Yes. So, and you're, you're wanting a job and you're thinking, she's thinking, okay, I think I'm worth X. And so what I'm going to do is, but, but maybe he'll offer Y. So I really want this job. So I'll just ask for Y. Well, what if he really wanted to ask, give you X? But if you go in and you say, I want, I want X, you may walk out with that. But if you said Y, cause that's what you, you thought, guess what you just did? You left money on the table. We're selling a house. Well, I don't know if someone will buy it for this amount, so I better ask this amount. When in six months ago market, maybe not today's market, they would have had that amount. But if you didn't, you did what? You left money on the table. Here's where that idiom fits in with us and God. Sometimes because we refuse to ask God to intervene in our lives, we miss out on his promises we miss out on his glory. We miss out on his joy. We miss out on his forgiveness. We leave money proverbially on the table. And that's not what God wants us to do. And there's no better example than right here. It's so cool. Immediately, he responded. Because that's what he wanted to do. And in our lives sometimes, we need to understand that. We don't, God don't want me to leave money on the table. God wants me to seek his grace, to seek his forgiveness. And when I do, that sets him up to respond. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes he may say, I'm not answering that prayer. I'm not going the direction that you want me to go. I'm staying along the course that I've laid out. Okay, and then we need, we need to respond to that. But that shows us here that sometimes God will. Are you missing God's kindness? Are you missing his joy? Are you missing his forgiveness and his redemption? Because maybe you're just not willing to look at God and say, no, God, please, please work in my life. Please work in this issue. Please bring me out of this tailspin. Because, see, when we seek the grace of God, oftentimes he will provide it and not leave us wanting. And that's what he wants to do. A good God offers another chance. So this is all set up. Everything's moving forward. God has said it's going to happen. Look what, what happens in verses 8 through 11. Now Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What will be the sign of the Lord will heal me, and that I will go up to the house of the Lord on the third day. So he had been told that was going to happen. Getting a sign from a prophet in the Old Testament days was somewhat normal, so this was not a big deal. This was not an act of a lack of faith. It was just an act of, of validation, if you will. But notice, this shall be the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will perform the word that he has spoken. Then he asked him, shall, this, this is so funny, this is where the miracle comes in. Shall the shadow go forward 10 steps or go back 10 steps? He's basically saying, it's 1 o'clock. Do you want the, the shadow to look like 1.30 or do you want the shadow to look like 12.30? Kind of that idea, kind of crude example, but that way. Now, Hezekiah said, it's easy for the shadow to decline. No, but the shadow turned backward 10 steps. Then Isaiah the prophet called out to the Lord. He brought the shadow on the stairway back ten steps by which it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. He confirmed to Hezekiah, I am working, I will work, I'll do this miracle. And Hezekiah was restored, we're told, for another 15 years of his life. A racehorse, famous racehorse from years ago, Seabiscuit. And you may know the name of the horse. You may have seen the movie and, and, and a pretty cool movie. And there's a scene in the movie um, where Mr. Howard has purchased the horse. He needs a trainer for the horse. And so he encounters 
a potential trainer by the name of Tom Smith and trying to build this relationship and see if this is the guy. And they have an interchange that is so important. And here's the thing. This, this phrase is used not only once but twice in the movie. But here's that interchange. Take a gander. Howdy. Hello. You hungry? No, no, thanks. I'm fine. Charles Howard. Tom Smith. Nice to meet you, Tom. What's, uh, what's in his bandage? Oh, that's, uh, Hawthorne root. It increases circulation. You want to sit down? Oh, all right. Thank you. <coughs> Can't really get better. Already is, a little. Will he race? No, not that one. So why are you fixing him? Because I can. Every horse is good for something. He, he could be a cart horse or a leaf pony. He's still nice to look at. You know, you don't throw a whole life away just because he's banged up a little. You don't throw a whole life away because it's banged up a little. Now, what's interesting about that scene is you go deeper into the movie and the jockey character is having is, is struggling. And the trainer, Tom, telling you the story a little bit, but that's okay. You'll forget it No, uh, when you watch it. But no, Tom is frustrated with the, the, the jockey. And guess what Mr. Howard tells him? You don't throw a whole life away just because it's banged up a little bit. See, we get in our minds that my lack of perfection, my being immensely banged up, has disqualified me from having God work in my life, has disqualified me from tasting of the goodness and the faithfulness of the Lord. It's disqualified me from letting God do something fresh and anew and redemptive. Amen. You don't throw a life away because it's a little banged up. If we're not careful in our families, in our friend groups, in our churches, and in our culture, you have one mark, and you're gone. You're set aside. Whereas in the economy of God, he acknowledges our issues. He acknowledges what's going on. But he always will rebuild, even if it takes a miracle to do so. I love that statement when... When Tom was asked about doing it, he, says, he goes, because that's what I do. And I don't know about you, but I can just hear God when someone comes. I come before him and say, why are you doing that? It's because of what I do. I rebuild. I remold. I reshape. I give another hope. That's the God we love. That's the God we serve. A lot of times I think we're, we're tempted not to pursue God's second chance because why is God going to waste his time on me? You're not a waste of time. God will work. God will move. We can taste of his, his kindness, his, his goodness, the way he overcomes and the way he works. So here's a question. You know, I, I said at the beginning, let's evaluate. Evaluate today as we walk through this what's going on in your relationships, what's going on in your finances and your health and, and personal issues at work, wherever it may be. And where do you need another chance? So let's circle back to use that phrase. Where do you need help? Where, where do you acknowledge that you need a healing touch of the power of God? In your marriage? 
in your relationships with your kiddos? Where do you need health? Where do you need healing? Do you need healing in your mindset and perspective? Do you need your healing in what you look at when you look in the mirror in the morning and you don't see what God looks at? What do you need? The God of good news, the God of the gospel, is the God that looks at your life and my life and says, I give you another chance. I want to walk with you again. So how do, we, how do we go about this? What does God do to show that this is possible? You know, it starts with salvation. If we're not careful, we'll look at salvation and say, salvation is something I do to make God happy with me. Salvation is something I do to, to, to please God. Salvation is attained when, when I walk as God wants me to walk. The Bible has a different answer to that question, to that. The Bible says throughout, but Paul's words in Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. God does a miracle of salvation in me when I open my heart to him. And so when I look at God and I say, God, you, you, I don't deserve you. God, I don't deserve your grace. God, if you only knew what I did. And by the way, God knows what you did. Um, he knows what we do. So it doesn't shock him. But instead he says, okay. But I still extend to you my grace. That's the first thing. So God extends grace. God listens. I love 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that which we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, that's the caveat, his will, he hears us. Hezekiah did that. Hezekiah went before God and pled. Yes. And God's sovereignty said, I will respond to you. And so we see that. And we see God working there. You may think God's not going to hear me. God will listen to you. Okay? Then God also extends forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous, faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Think about that. If I am willing to step into the presence of God and say, God, I, I, I recognize there's, I'm where I am because of actions I've taken that are sinful or against you, that God in his grace will look at me and will extend forgiveness and grace, redemption, and a chance to move forward. The God of the universe, the God that made you and me, the God that sent his son to die for me and die for you, the God that, that rose him from the grave, that brought him to his right side and will send him again one day, is the God that can look into my life and do a miracle to restore me to him and use me. Amen. That's who God is. So the question that each of us just has to ask is, God, in whatever small area or big area of my life, well, I'll let you come in and give me another chance. So that's the challenge today. Where do you need that other chance? And will you lay it before the Father? Will you do that? So here's what we call the response time. Here's what the invitation is. The invitation is God is offering you all of him. God is offering you a relationship with him through his son, Jesus. Will you be willing if you've never sought Christ, sought God through a relationship with Jesus Christ, would you be willing to accept that invitation today? That's an invitation not from me, it's from God himself. I would love to talk to you about it. Pastor Josh will be with me in a moment up here. Would you like to respond, talk to us or talk after? I can meet with you this week. Or right where you are, would you like to go understand that you can simply admit your sins, believe in Christ as Savior and Lord, and confess him as your Savior and Lord? I'd love to talk to you, but God extends that invitation. God extends the invitation to you today for you to come to him and start talking to him about your burdens and your heartache. Will, will you begin that relationship in that way and talk in that way? And then finally, God extends forgiveness. Will you seek it? As we worship together in a moment, and Beth, I'm going to ask you and our team to come. As they gather and they're going to get in place, as we have this, this time of what we call response, it is a very important part of worship because 
at when everything is said and done, is what we do with the gospel that makes a difference. Hearing the gospel doesn't change my life. Doing the gospel does. So this is a time for you and I to, to ponder what God has, has challenged us with and how does God want me to move forward. Pastor Josh and I will be here. Come and talk to us. Come and pray with us. If you want to come and, and pray before the Father by yourself or with a friend, feel free to do so. So let's stand. Let's worship together. Let's respond as God is touching our hearts. Thank you.